It's amazing being here. So on July 4th, 2014, which is Independence Day in America, uh, what you see on the screen here was posted by the first patient from Australia that actually went over to America to my clinic to get treatment for food allergy. And it says, hope is the little voice you hear whisper maybe when it seems the rest of the world is shouting no. And I am so thankful that that particular family did not listen to the no's. And I'm glad I haven't listened to the no's because we've both heard a lot of them. But today, hopefully we can have uh, some hope and provide a, a way of thinking about, an innovative way of thinking about food allergy. Some objectives today, I wanna to identify some of the barriers to treating food allergy, review some key research, and also present, like I said, an individualized, integrated approach to patients with adverse food reactions. First though, I wanna talk about my why, my purpose. Why am I here? What would bring me here? It's really about people and about patients. And many years ago, when I, was when I was treating food allergies, I wasn't really treating them. And every time a patient would come in and I would have to tell them, this is your diagnosis, you have to avoid carrier epinephrine and hope that you don't react or hope you don't come in contact, it was always very disheartening to me and very disheartening to patients. And I thought, what good am I really doing in the world here? Not much, because that patient's still at risk. They have to live a life similar to what everyone lived in the pandemic. If you think about the pandemic, I think the real pandemic is food allergy, actually. Because if you think about that, what life did we live during the pandemic? It was one of isolation. It was one of fear. It was one of misinformation. It was one of propaganda. And people were excluded and they were scared. They, they lived in fear for something that was microscopic and potentially life-threatening. Guess what? That's the life of somebody with food allergy every single day. It's that fear. And what wasn't talked about is kind of that collateral damage of the psychosocial aspects, the emotional aspects, the financial toll, all of the things that go along with it. And I found 10 plus years ago, 12 years ago, I thought there has to be a different way. There has to be a better way, a different approach. And so after meeting with patients, I just thought I've got to do something more for them. And that's where we came up with the, pre the treatment program that we do today. And something that I've been working on, modifying and improving over the last decade. So really, the reason I'm here is for patients. It's for you. That's, why, that's my why. We want to dispel fear and myths with good evidence and good education. Ultimately, we want to hear the unheard, understand the misunderstood, and provide hope to those who perhaps don't have any. So what's the problem with food allergy? One in 13 children, one in 10 adults have food allergy. This can cost in Australia dollars over $6,200 per year with people with food allergy. 40% of children report being bullied in school and they can have nutrition and calorie deficits due to restricted diets. What's even more interesting is almost double the amount of people who have food allergy think they have food allergy. And that's an issue. There are many barriers, fear, lack of resources, and when I say lack of resources, it's not just treatment, it's even diagnostic testing uh, can be a problem. The ability for people to get an accurate diagnosis, to be able to have perhaps food challenges done. Some parts of the world don't even have access to epinephrine. There may be poor access to allergen-free foods, and this can be very detrimental and scary to a lot of folks. More, more than anything, there's misinformation and a lack of education and often a misunderstanding for food allergy. And why is there misunderstanding? If you look at how a body may react or have an adverse reaction to foods, there's a whole menu. You can see it on there. There's a whole menu of ways that people may have an adverse reaction to foods. 
but everyone wants to put that into one bucket, the food allergy bucket. But that may not always be accurate. There may be food sensitivities. There might be food intolerances. There may be autoimmune disease. There may be IgE-mediated food allergy. There may be non-IgE-mediated. And I'm going to get into a little bit of what that means. For the remainder of the presentation, a lot of what I'm going to focus on is what's called IgE-mediated food allergy because that is what potentially threatens somebody's life. There's another thing called FPIs that can as well, but that's beyond the scope of today. But we will focus on primarily the IgE-mediated food allergy. So there's a lot that goes into how a body reacts and responds to a food. The tests are imperfect. Why are they imperfect? Why is there misunderstanding? Why does everyone want to just throw it into one bucket? Not to bog you down on this slide too much or bore you too much with science, but, I, but with this, I'm going to dispel a lot of myths. I'm going to dispel some misunderstanding, okay, about food allergy and about testing. So, with an IgE-mediated food allergy, what happens? What's happening to somebody? If you look at the left, on the purple, there's a cell. And it's either called a mast cell or a basophil. Inside that cell, there's different chemicals. The most commonly known is histamine. We all know that because of antihistamines. There's histamines, there's things called tryptase, there's all kinds of inflammatory proteins. We all have them. Whether you have food allergy or not, you all have these cells, we all have them. We all contain the chemicals. That's not the problem. The problem is if those chemicals ever get released from that cell. It's like spam text messages within your body, uh, cl cluttering up things and you get a reaction to it. What triggers that cell to open up? That's kind of the question. If you look on that, in the middle photograph there on that slide, you'll see a yellow Y-shaped protein. It's called IgE. That's where IgE-mediated food allergy comes from is that. So it's that protein. When somebody gets exposed to something they're allergic to, they get sensitized, okay? They start producing IgE, specific for whatever they're allergic to. And that then docks onto the cell. You can see it on that middle slide there. It's just docking there and it sits there. That's still not the biggest problem. It just sits there and it waits. But then when you have exposure to whatever you're allergic to, on the far right, you'll see that food, if you will, in this case, whether it's peanut, milk, eggs, I don't care what it is, whatever that food is, it then binds like a lock-in key mechanism to that IgE. That is what sends the signal into the cell to open it up and release all the chemicals. Why am I spending so much time on this? Because what we do with food allergy testing, the traditional standard food allergy testing, is we measure this. We measure IgE and it's very specific. We can measure it to peanut, we can measure it to wheat, we can measure it to eggs. We can do it in the blood, or you can do it with a skin test. Those are the traditional tests. And so often, if you look at the bottom, if you can see it, there's a bunch of numbers. There's some where, what does it say, dog in this case is 82, dust mite is above 100, egg is 95, peanut 93. So these are big numbers, right? So what'll happen is somebody's gonna get a test result, they're gonna look at that, and they're gonna say, ah, oh, we have all this IgE and so we're severe, we're severely allergic and my number is higher than your number and so I'm more severe than you are because I'm making all this IgE and it's gonna cause a severe reaction, right? No, that's not the whole story. And this is where misunderstanding comes into play because people will often say, the bigger the number, the more severe. That's actually inaccurate, that's a myth. I don't know if you can see the fine print down at the bottom here, but it says, not all sensitizations may result in clinical symptoms. The greater the sensitization, the more likelihood of clinical significance. 
it does not say the higher the number, the more severe the reaction. This is where misunderstanding comes into play because we're not understanding these tests, for instance. It's not necessarily the higher the number because somebody even with a low number can react severely. It's just the likelihood. Why is this the case? And why am I spending so much time on this? I'm spending so much time on this because it's, a, it's a, such a big part of misunderstanding. Tests and also recommendations that are given to people. If you look on that far right photograph, the little yellow part that's connecting the IgE protein, it looks pretty simple. It connects, it sends a signal in. I wanna blow that up. So this is the part that people don't know. This is the part people don't understand. And this is where I wanna start demystifying what's going on. If you take that little segment and you blow it up, not that you need to memorize this, there will be a test at the end. But now that you need to memorize this, but look at all of the proteins, look at all of the signaling that occurs with this. There is a whole cascade of events. And if you look on there, these are not static. They're not fixed. All of these proteins are under regulation and counter-regulation, and sometimes somebody may have more in their body or less in their body. And guess what? it gets more, there's more than just that. There's also other proteins that the body makes that influences whether somebody actually reacts to a food or not. There's proteins called IgG4 or TGF beta or IL-10, not that you have to memorize those, I just want you to hear them. I just want you to know these things exist. They're out there and it is so much more than just a little bit. It's so much more than just an IgE, and if you really want to look at it, look at that subway map. That is kind of a summary of everything that's occurring. But it's even more than that. It has to do with the amount of food, what time, what's your metabolism, do you have food in the stomach, what time of day it is, what, month of, what time of the month it is for females. Are there any underlying conditions? Did you exercise? Are you fatigued? Are you stressed? What's your microbiome like? All of these things play a role into this. And you're gonna see in a few minutes why I spent so much time explaining this to you because it's important that you have a context with that to understand how we're going to better individualize treatment and therapy. It's important to understand the limitations and some of the complexities that we face and also the misinformation that may come about. So what can we do? We can increase our, our understanding. We can dispel myth and fear. We can have compassion for other people. We can have compassion on their own journey and understand their numbers may not be the same as your numbers, but it doesn't mean that anyone is less or less important or less severe or more important. It doesn't mean any of that. There's newer tests that are, that are coming out. We've developed tests, it's called a base fill activation test. There's, there's technology that we've been utilizing in our clinic for years that we actually wanna to bring to Australia. So we wanna find reliable resources. What you can do is demand better. You can demand better from the medical community, demand better from your doctors, and you can seek options for treatment because they are available. What is in the pipeline for treatment? There's a whole list of things. There's things to treat this called oral immunotherapy or sublingual immunotherapy. What does that mean? The immunotherapies are a way that we can take a microscopic amount of food and, and administer it to a patient in a calculated, methodical way to alter the immune system. We can alter that subway map that I showed you. And I'm gonna get back to that. But it is a way of utilizing food to influence the cellular level of a person. There's also products, there's vaccines that are coming out, peanut vaccines, there's, there's peanut capsules, there's different, there's a toothpaste actually that will be coming out for peanut. Uh, there's patches, different kinds of patches. So there's all kinds of products that are coming down the pipeline. The problem with some of these is they're all peanut focused. 
This was my very first patient that I treated back in 2013, by the way, um, with uh, oral immunotherapy. When we talk about treatment with immunotherapy, before we even get to treatment, there's one thing that I have to met mention is prevention measures. So even before an allergy occurs, we have more and more information about providing good solid food to patients at an early age in the context of their gut health and their microbiome to where we could prevent food allergy from even occurring. But if the allergy has already occurred, what can we do? Well, there are things, as I said, like oral immunotherapy, sublingual immunotherapy, where we can administer these foods in a calculated way so that we can modify that whole cascade of events that may occur and get somebody to eat their food and consume it safely. There is a lot of research going on in this area. Spain, Europe, Canada, the United States, all have published guidelines about how this is to be done. I've been an author on some of these papers. If you look, it's kind of hard to see on this slide. I apologize, I thought maybe there'd be a bigger screen, but um, on this slide, it just gives a summary of all the different approaches from countries around the world and, and the approach that they're taking with trying to treat IgE-mediated food allergy. Every country has a slightly different flavor to how they're treating it. One of the treatment measures is a product called Palforzia. This is a pharmaceutical product that was, in the, that was FDA approved in the United States only for peanut. And it was approved for patients aged 14 to 17. They are able to use this product in conjunction with a peanut avoidance diet. This has been out in the United States now for four years. I will tell you, I started treatment, food allergy treatment, over 10 years ago. So about six years before this product was FDA approved. Um, and a lot of people were hesitant to do any kind of treatment until this was approved. Why? Because people told them that's what they needed to do. Um, they were waiting for kind of that pharmaceutical FDA approved product. There's nothing wrong with it. But there are also commercially available foods that we can also use in a similar fashion for treatment. When people talk about commercially available foods, there's a certain perception to it. In particular, those that are doing a pharmaceutical grade product will often downplay a bit the commercial foods. And there's kind of a perception that when we do kind of the commercially available products, it's almost like we're, there's some perception that it's some potion you know, in the background where it's some brew that we're doing. That's not the case. The reality is, even when we use commercially available foods, it's done very carefully, methodically, scientifically. Precision it is used when we're using commercially available foods. This in the United States and Europe is growing quite rapidly. There's publications on best practices for using commercially available foods uh, to treat food allergy. I'm the president of a nonprofit organization in the United States called the Food Allergy Support Team. I helped co-found it several years ago. What's interesting is we did a survey recently that 129, 129 practices from the United States responded to our survey. We've treated conservatively over 26,000 patients in the United States. And We've treated foods such as peanut, tree nuts, milk, eggs, wheat, shellfish, uh, across the board, sesame, sunflower. Most of the practices are treating even infants down nine months old, all the way up through the oldest patients I've treated 65 years old. Most of the respondents, interestingly, less than 5% used a pharmaceutical grade product, the Palforzia. 95% of the treatment that's being done in the United States is with quality food. Just quality, commercially available food. Used correctly. Used 
in the right way with precision. This data demonstrates the breadth and the depth of food allergy treatment being implemented by board certified allergists, not only in the United States, but across the world. There's published protocols. We are able to take these published protocols that have been around for a decade and apply them to a person. Opponents of what we do will often say it's not a cure. I ask them, do we withhold insulin from a diabetic because it has potential side effects, because it has to be regulated, and because it's not a cure? No, we don't. Do we withhold cancer or ke chemotherapy from cancer patients because it has a potential side effect, or because it's not a cure? No, we don't. We use good science, we use precision, we use caution, and we understand the risks and the benefits, the pros and the cons of both sides. Many will say more data is needed. I often say, how much data do you need? We have over a decade. I have patients that finished this a decade ago. How much data do you need? When is enough? They often say we need standardized products and protocols. Yes, we absolutely need some kind of standardization, but I'll tell you that is not the end-all be-all. There is more to it than just that. We can do better. Prior to the pandemic, I had a lovely group of people, and many of them are here, who came over to the United States, visited me in my clinic and spent time there. 36 patients, to be exact. This was prior to the pandemic. And this cohort of patients, I have to applaud. They're amazing people. They had so much courage, so much foresight to come over. And I'm so proud and honored that they entrusted me to come over to uh, get treatment. Let me tell you a little bit about this group collectively. This group of 36 patients was avoiding 332 foods. 332 foods they were avoiding, they were told to avoid prior to coming to our clinic. Out of that 30, the 36 patients, we determined that 31 of them should do what's called food challenges to prove whether they were allergic or not to the foods that they were told they had to avoid. 216 foods, food challenges were passed. So we did, we did 230 food challenges with this group of patients. 216 foods were introduced back into their diet prior to therapy even starting. Only 14 didn't pass the food challenge. Think about that for a minute. Think about how many of you may be in here that perhaps had a diagnosis of 10, 15, 20, 30 foods that you're having to avoid and that you don't quite know which to have or not to have. What kind of impact can we make in someone even before treating by just getting them a good diagnosis? By just sorting through the ability of saying, you can safely have this one, you need to avoid this one. 332 foods this group was avoiding. That's a big deal. Think about that in your life. I mean. When you have to avoid one food versus five foods versus 10 foods, it's one thing for me as an allergist to sit in a clinic and to look at a patient and say, you know what, you need to avoid these 10 foods, carry your EpiPen, read the food labels, do your best, and hopefully nothing happens. I walk out the room and I'm on to the next patient. What have I just done to that patient's life? Changed every second of every day every single second of every day, I changed them because they now live in fear every second of every day of the avoidance. And when you're having to deal with one food versus 10 foods, that's a big deal. So just being able to get an accurate diagnosis is staggering. When, when I hear the word Australia is the food allergy capital of the world, I kind of wonder, is it really or is it, or what's the, we need to do better at diagnostics. Absolutely need to do better at diagnostics. 
When we finally got to treatment with this group, this is what we treated. 33 patients did multiple foods in their treatment program. Three patients did a single food. The single foods, by the way, were peanut, wheat, it was either milk or eggs, I can't remember. I'm blanking on the third, but it was peanut, wheat, and either milk or eggs. That was a single. Every other person did multiple foods. In that group, we treated 116 foods with a 92% success rate. You can see the foods that were treated, the right. All of this was done, by the way, not with a pharmaceutical product, not one. It was done with quality food, implemented correctly with good science, careful monitoring, done in a methodical, strategic way. What is the power of food? It can scare you to death or put you in a life-threatening situation or when used correctly, we can change that at the cellular level to where now we can thrive and do good. I'm just gonna skip some of these because they're too hard to see. Actually, this one I want you to look at. So when, at the far right corner there, what you can see, when we start doing oral immunotherapy or treatment with food, just quality food, guess what happens? It starts at the DNA level. It starts with instructions and chemical messengers throughout the body. It's not just IgE. It is a whole host of things. And the body starts changing. And again, this is food. This is the power of food on the body. And what can happen is those IgE levels that we talked about, they can start dropping. And then protective or neutralizing antibodies called IgG and IgA can be increased. And by the way, a lot of people use I, IgG and IgA to foods poorly because they will claim that that is what causes food sensitivity. We actually prove it's what causes tolerance. It is what gives tolerance to the body. We don't need big pharma. What we need are bigger farms. We need quality food. That, by the way, is my dad's farm on the right. It's where I grew up. Um, but we just need bigger farms and quality food. Let's consider some of the solutions that are currently out there. I started with my why and the problem. Do you remember the statistics? At the very beginning, I said there was one in 13 people, one in 13 children, and one in 10 adults that have food allergy. Many are bullied. $6,200 a year per, per family, per food. That's not the real problem. Those are just the, the statistics. What leads to the statistics? Why do we have the statistics? I want us to think a little bit more in depth on that. Why? Why do we have the statistics? Mainly because of a disruption in our microbiome, our gut health. Whether it's microbiome, we often think of it in the gut, but we also have a microbiome on the skin. We also have a microbiome in our, in our lungs. There's many things that are disrupting to the microbiome. Hygiene, C-sections, antibiotics, antacids, stress, poor diet. All of those things lead to a disruption in the microbiome. This is the why behind the statistics. Disruption of this can wreak havoc on our body and how we respond. Vitamin D deficiency, genetics, those types of things can wreak havoc. This is the why behind our statistics. The reason I bring this up is when you think about, I gave a list of food allergy treatments that are in development. Briefly mentioned peanut vaccines or toothpastes or patches or even oral immunotherapy. Do these treatments really get to the cause? Many of them do not. First of all, many are just focused on peanut. But I've already demonstrated there's more to the world than peanut. There's all kinds of foods that people struggle with. In fact, a majority of people have other allergies other than peanut. So when we look at the food allergy treatments that are listed, I want to pose the question, how well do they do at addressing the, the causes of the statistics, meaning the microbiome disruptors, 
the maturation, those types of things. What I want to propose is shifting from just focusing on an effect, just the effect of food allergy, but really how can we take this fragmentation and really integrate it into a person? Where food allergy doesn't happen in isolation. It's not just one thing. It's a food coming into the context of a person. A person. They're not a diagnosis. They're not a problem. They're not a disorder. They're a person. And when the food comes in, it's coming into a whole host into their context. It's coming into their stress. It's coming into their hormones. It's coming into what their metabolism is. It's coming into all of those things and that's how they respond. So when we treat someone, this isn't so much about fitting a, per, fitting a patient into a standardized product or protocol. More than that, I think we need to adapt our products and protocols to the person and individualize it to them. And look at them as a whole. We need to look at their mental fitness, their emotional fitness, their physical fitness, all of those types of things because that plays a role in how we treat them. Not to bog you down too much in, in science here, but there is a bi-directional relationship between our nervous system and our immune system in the context of our hormones. They work in close proximity to each other. You can't do one without the other, which is why all of these other things come into play. And it plays a role with how the body interacts with a food on a given day at a given time. It also, play, it, it also explains why we cannot predict, for instance, in a food allergic patient, the amount of food that's going to cause a specific type of reaction. We can't predict that. The numbers don't predict that. They don't predict severity. They don't predict the type of reaction. And the amount of food that somebody has does not predict that either. Why? Because of this. Because it's not just a number. It's not just that. That's why I went into all the detail before of showing you kind of the complexity of this. It's the context of the person. You remember that? The map, the amount, the type of food, the metabolism, the hormones, the medication, the microbiome, all of those things play a role. So when we treat a person, we look at all of these things. We think through all of these, these aspects. I believe in an in individualized, integrated approach to food ad adverse reactions. What's the context of the person? When I walk into a room with somebody, probably one of the first things I think about is what's their trauma been? Even before thinking about the food allergy or even their reaction, I just think, what's their trauma been? My very first slide of the, of the first family that came over from Australia, I remember thinking, why would somebody come from Australia to America? Why would that happen? What would motivate somebody to do that? And the only thing I could think of is they had to have some significant trauma. It had to be there. There has to be something that's motivating that. The trauma, the desperation, the fear. That's what I think about first with people. And, and it, it can't be missed. That plays as much of a role with somebody and their response to a food as anything and also the response to treatment. So what I like to think about is what are their social stressors, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, what are all of those kinds of stressors that are going on within the person? And when I talk to people, that's what I try and figure out. What's their trauma? What's the underlying issue? Then we combine that with what's their gut health? What is their gut health telling us? What's their microbiome look like? And then what's the quality of their food? Again, food allergy treatment is so much more than just fitting a person into a protocol or a pharmaceutical product. It's about taking a person, understanding the person, 
understanding their trauma, understanding what they've been through, and adapting our products and protocols into that individual. We have to be adaptable in their journey. Um, thank you for your time. Appreciate everyone. I hope with this, I was able to shed some light, kind of shed a new perspective on how I think we need to think and approach food adverse reactions. It's so much more than just a food. It's so much more than just a disorder. It's about a person. It's about their life. It's about their history. It's about meeting somebody where they are and guiding them to where they want to be so that they can have that chance to live their life. Getting back to the pandemic, when we were in it, when we were all in isolation, what was the thing that people talked about the most? Getting back to a sense of normalcy. Normalcy. Post-pandemic, our normal may be different than what it was pre-pandemic. When somebody tells me what we do isn't a cure, I say, that's okay. What we want to do is help people achieve their normal, achieve their sense of normalcy, achieve who they want to be and who, what they want to become without fear, without the burden. And I'll tell you, w one of the things that I did not appreciate 10 years ago was the burden that families carry with food allergy. I could only start gaining an appreciation of the burden that was carried once I saw it lifted. That's when I be began to tune in to, wow, this is a massive burden. I had a patient who was about seven years old that would not look me in the eye. He would come into clinic. He would not make eye contact. He would not smile. He would, he would not do anything. He was scared. As we progressed through treatment, one of the things I started to notice was he started to gain some confidence. At first, he started to have eye contact with me. Then he started to smile. Then he started to talk. Then he started to joke. He would draw pictures for me. He would bring them in. Towards the end, he was wearing a fireman's hat. And his mom told me, um, out of the blue, this patient said, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. And the mom said, it took her off guard because she had asked him for years, what do you want to be when you grow up? He would never answer the question. Never answer the question. And out of the blue, on his own, he came to her and said, I want to be a fireman. And she said, what's changed? You never used to tell me what you want to be when you'd grow up. And he said, I never thought I would live that long. I never thought I would get that chance. I was a seven-year-old that was carrying that burden. But as we were able to progress through treatment and individualize and address his needs, the burden was lifted. And guess what? He had a personality. He had a smile. He had dreams. He had hopes. I have no idea what he wants to be now. But he had that. And that's what can happen. Thank you for your attention, and I appreciate your time. I'm going to be at our booth at the end if you have any questions. Thank you.